We are on time. Yeah. Yeah. I will ask them if everything is fine with you. So good morning. Uh, I would like uh, to start uh, the design of the sensor system and advanced sensor technologies. In this session, uh, the, we have the three, uh, six uh, topics. In, uh, uh, each topic has uh, uh, 15 uh, minutes, including the questions and the comments. Okay. I would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Popov. The uh, title is a high sensitive uh, Xenon uh, measurement, please, Dr. Popov. <coughs> Morning. Good morning, everyone. The topic of, uh, of my talk is high sensitive xenon measurement. Um, I'll divide my presentation into three parts. Um, new approach to high sensitive xenon measurement, first results and conclusions. To start uh, with, uh, let me talk about the main aim of the large sample approach. Uh, the important task of the approach is defining uh, the ratio of the following isotopes, xenon 133M to xenon 133, xenon 131M to xenon 133 at the xenon 133 background level, 10 in the third negative uh, power becquerel per cubic meter. It is necessary for identification of the injection source. There are two ways to achieve this goal. Either significant... Uh, there are two ways to achieve this goal. Either significant uh, minimum detectable activity improvement of large or large volume sample measurements. The large sample approach is focused on the second point. Uh, let me move on to the next point. What is the large sample technology? Uh, the volume of pure xenon sample is more than 100 milliliters. A honeycomb structure of better detectors based on C-pin diodes efforts to manufacture detectors of various volume from 15 milliliters to 500 milliliters. Что используя продукцию воздухозащитных заводов можно получить такую МДА, МДС. Use of air separation plants uh, products allows to measure xenon isomers with minimum detectable uh, concentration. Uh, n times uh, 10 in, th in the seventh negative power becquerel per cubic meter. Uh, preparation of the xenon spectrometric sample includes the following steps. Taking out the xenon krypton concentrate uh, produced by air separating plants, 92% uh, of krypton, 7% of xenon and radon. Enrichment of the xenon sample and cleaning it from radon. And splitting the sample into pure xenon and krypton. 
а спектрометрический препарат ксенона? Спектрометрический препарат ксенон. Значит, надо отметить, что таких заводов больше сотни, ну, вот, и сколько они перерабатывают кубов. Uh, large uh, air separating plants uh, process, uh, processes more than um, 10 in the ninth power cubic meters per day. Uh, there are more than uh, 100 large air separation plants around the globe. То, что нет проблем получить один литр вот этого из концентрата, второй пункт. Uh, we developed and tested a mobile unit which can produce more than one liter of pure xenon from xenon cryptone concentrate. Um, and the cost of xenon cryptone concentrate is less than uh, three dollars per liter. Ну а сейчас, ну вот это самое, зачитайте, что установка такая, это я расскажу, первый пункт. Mm -hmm. uh, let me talk about the functioning of the separation purification unit for the large sample. Uh, the installation has robust design and is easy in operation. Uh, the unit can extract up to one liter per day, uh, one, one liter of xenon per day. And duration of the working cycle is approximately four hours. Ну, mm -hmm. шаги технологии сейчас. The main technological steps are as follows. Смотрите на рисунок. Значит, have a look at the picture, please. Первый шаг это когда соединяется баллон с ККС и установка заборник ампула заборник ксенона. The first uh, the first step uh, is um, uh, Uh, xenon, uh, xenon extraction from xenon uh, krypton concentrate uh, in the xenon trap. Ampula приемник xenona заполнена активируемым углем. The ampula uh, container of xenon is filled with um, activated charcoal. Ну, следует отметить, что все ловушки, и радоновая ловушка, и ампула приемник ксенона все заполнены одной маркой активированного угля. Uh, all the traps are filled with the same brand of the uh, activated charcoal. Uh, ловушка приемник ксенона, ну, адсорбер, находится при температуре минус 100 градусов. Uh, the xenon absorber, uh, adsorber is cooled up to uh, 100 uh, degrees in Celsius. Это может достигнуть либо использование спиртно-азотной смеси, легко весьма, Uh, либо криостат. Uh, we can reach it uh, either by using uh, alcohol nitrogen mixture or by using a cryostat. Мы для наших задач использовали спиртно-азотную смесь. Uh, we used um, alcohol nitrogen mixture. Значит, криптонксеновая смесь пропускается из баллона через uh, адсорбер. Криптон зенон мигче и трансферт through the transformer. И сбрасывается либо в атмосферу криптон, который оттуда выходит, либо в сборник криптона, который можно поставить на выходе. Криптон строен either in atmosphere or into the krypton container. Ну для последующего измерения криптона 85. Uh, for further measurement of um, Krypton 85. Следующий этап отсоединяется баллон, вот это отсоединяется. Ловушка, uh, то есть uh, ловушка уже ксеноновая нагревается до температуры 200 градусов Цельсия. Uh, the И, next stage uh -huh. is uh, heating uh, the uh, xenon trap up to 200 degrees in Celsius. И часть смеси криптона с ксеноном сбрасывается тоже в атмосферу. До определенного давления там, и температуры достижит. И, угу, угу. Uh, в этом ампуле приемки ксенона остается практически чистый ксенон. Ксенон ампула contains um, almost pure ксенон. Затем, как я сказал, ампула догревается до 200 градусов. 
as I have already said, uh, the ampulla is uh, heated uh, up to uh, 200 uh, degrees uh, in Celsius, and ampulla container is cooled uh, by the uh, liquid nitrogen. Баллон отсоединяется, здесь закрывается. Соединение с атмосферой тоже закрывается. Ампула находится в жидком азоте и работает как насос. Она ксенон поступает из этой ампулы, проходит через радоновую ловушку и поступает в ампулу приемник ксенона. The balloon is disconnected and closed. Через радоновую ловушку вот это. Xenon is transferred through the radon trap. И поступает в ампулу приемник ксенона. And proceeds to the ampulla container of xenon. Затем эта ампула также нагревается до 200 градусов, и выделяющийся ксенон забирается с помощью шприца дозатора. Then the ampulla is also heated up to 200 degrees in Celsius, in Celsius, and xenon is taken by the means of syringe dosator. Который затем напускается в измерительную камеру установки, работающую по схеме бета-гамма совпадения. Um, and uh, then uh, the krypton is taken to uh, the measurement camera, uh, working uh, according to the um, beta gamma coincidence scheme. Степень очистки от радона это 10, более чем 10 седьмой раз. Cleaning from ra uh, radon is more than uh, 10 in the seventh power times. Содержание криптона менее 0,1%. одного uh, процента. And uh, krypton is less than one percent. Вес установки от 15 до 15 килограмм. The installation weight is uh, from 15 up to 20 kilograms. Такая технология была нами мной и Приловским была разработана еще в 70-х годах. The technology was developed by Mr. Popov and Mr. Priloski uh, in 70s. И было получено несколько тысяч препаратов ксенона. And more than several thousands sample, large samples have been produced. Сейчас эта установка претерпела существенную модернизацию. Now this installation has been modernized significantly. Повышена степень очистки от радона, коэффициент очистки от радона. Uh, we have increased uh, the degree of um, radon purification. И на этой установке можно получать от 50 uh, миллилитров ксенона до одного литра. Um, due to this installation, uh, we uh, can get uh, from 50 milliliters up to one liter xenon. Ну, конечно, перерабатывая различные объемы ККС. Um, by by processing, uh, by processing various volumes of uh, xenon krypton mixture. Также MDC спектрометра, также MDC этого метода мы улучшили в десятки раз, ну в сотню раз по сравнению с старым вариантом. We have improved improved. Сотни раз. We have improved the sensitivity hundredfolds. Так как раньше мы использовали кристалл натрия с колодцем, где измеряли препарат ксенона, сорбированный на угле. We used to use sodium iod well. А сейчас мы используем детектор, работающий по схеме бета-гамма совпадения. And now we use the detector working according to бета-гамма coincidence scheme. Вот детектор, работающий по схеме бета-гамма совпадения. Let me present you the detector system for the large sample working according to the бета-гамма coincidence scheme. Вот это натрий-йод-талий детектор. 
it is the, um, the sodium uh, iod uh, uh, tellium detector. Uh, the measurement camera is in the well. It is the uh, pre-amplifier. Да, я забыл сказать, вот это пробоперерабатывающая установка. Um, it is the processing installation. Mm -hmm. Detec uh, детектирующая камера uh, включает в себя 11 сетин детекторов. Uh, the detector camera um, is made of um, 11 independent CPIN diodes. Объем камеры 45 кубиков. Uh, the volume of uh, this uh, camera is uh, 45 milliliters. Можно подавать одну атмосферу, а можно две атмосферы. Uh, we can work either with one atmosphere or with two atmospheres. Камера устроена таким образом, как соты улья. Mm -hmm. То есть вот эти 45 uh, кубиков разбиты на 14 объемов. Uh, the structure of the uh, uh, camera is similar to honeycomb structure. Uh, каждый измерительный объем составляет около 4 кубиков. Uh, each me measurement volume is um, uh, about four, four milliliters. Из-за того, чтобы не было уменьшения эффективности регистрации. To make the uh, uh, registration efficacy, uh, uh, more um, efficient. Ну, давайте просто раз не то время. Последний MDC, вот эти, как показал опыт Гмельши, здесь у него спят вот самую последнюю строчку. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the MDC for those isotopes uh, is less than uh, 10 in the fifth negative power of the per cubic meter. Так. И вот спектры. Значит, все, все вот эти спектры представлены, когда фоновые или даже меньше, чем фоновые концентрации ксенона-133. Mm -hmm. Uh, the graph shows uh, the xenon isotopes background spectra. Значит, вот здесь четко проявляется пик 133 uh, Here you can see the peak of uh, xenon uh, 133. А правее пик от ксенона 135 214 кэп. Uh, and to the right side is the peak of xenon 135 uh, 214 кэп. Вот он 135 небольшое содержание 135. Дальше, это у нас спектр тоже фонового, фоновой концентрации ксенона 133-го. Uh, uh, И также здесь фоновый проявляется вот очень хорошо. You can see the background. Стат погрешности ксенона 133-го составляет около 1%. Uh, the uh, statistical uncertainty of xenon-133 is less than uh, 1%. На этом спектре тоже, но тут уже ксенон 131-го. Ага, все, вот это, 130 кэп и 160. Сейчас все последнее. Ага. Теперь conclusion. Mm -hmm. ага, прочитайте. And now the conclusions. Uh, the large sample approach and the equipment allow us to reach a minimum detectable uh, concentration of xenon 131M and xenon 133M approximately five times uh, uh, 10 in the fifth negative becquerel per, per cubic meter at the 24 hour measurement time and the sample volume less than 100 milliliters. Uh, structural, uh, structural concept of the large sample facility allows to acquire spectrometric products of xenon in the volume up to 1,000 uh, milliliter. Uh, honeycomb structure of the measuring camera guarantees the measurement of xenon, xenon isomers in such sample at the level of uh, N. Okay. Uh, n times uh, seven in the, um, uh, 10 in the seventh negative degree uh, becquerel per cubic meter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, we'll be glad to answer your questions. We have no time to discussions. Sorry. The, we would like to move on to the next uh, topics. Uh, the uh, title is a high uh, throw <coughs> put uh, Argon 33 uh, field uh, system. Uh, uh, Dr. Ayusan, please, et al. <coughs> Okay. 
Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Jim Hayes. I'm from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the Argon 37 system, um, field system that we built. Earlier in the week, you saw talks from Brian Melbreth, and he, he talked about the Argon 39 measurements that we made that we discovered down at the Nevada test site, <coughs> or that Nevada nuclear security site. And uh, Christine Johnson, who also talked about Argon 37 measurements that we're making at the same location. So today, I'm going to focus exclusively on the hardware of how we make the measurements, how we do the chemical processing. So um, I, don't have, I don't have data for results since we saw those already, so we'll go through this. Um, I will say that I don't have an acknowledgment page, but there's a very large team at PNNL that works on uh, different parts of the processing in this. Um, of course, it's not just me. I put the picture up to start with so we can get a visual about what, what it is that we built as we go through uh, the, the talk. This, the system that's shown on the bottom picture is the completed system that, that we have built. The picture on the top shows each of the functions of the system. And I'll go through those now and I'll talk about the chemistry on each one of these. There's a nitrogen separation system, an oxy oxygen reduction system, purification system, and a nuclear detection counting system. And then all of the integration of the components. Um, we, at PNNL, we work on a process, well, uh, on some chemical engineering processes called process intensification. And the developers out in the audience understand what I mean, but we try to make, make a laboratory capability small, compact, intelligent enough to put into a field capable system. And uh, this, this is a result of a, a lot of uh, detailed chemical engineering to reduce size and power and make unique processes to be able to, to purify and uh, measure argon-37. So as we've seen before, argon-37 is an activation product. We, we spent a lot of time in the past few years trying to get high quality xenon samples from the soil gas. And one of the things that we really struggled with was intrusion of atmospheric air into the, into the sample. It's re very difficult to separate atmospheric xenon from soil gas xenon. But what we really want is we want to make sure that the xenon that we're measuring came out of the nuclear test. And so xenon is a fission product. It'll, it'll be generated in the test. And it'll percolate up to the surface. And if you want to get a subsurface sample, um, you've got to seal that sample off from the atmosphere. Argon-37, when added to this capability, which is an activation product from neutron activation of calcium in the soil, if we can measure both the xenon and the argon, our confidence in, in that it was a nuclear detection goes up significantly. So a little bit of a motivation for why we want to have an argon system that you can take to the field and, and make high quality measurements. So we started out with some requirements. Um, First requirement is that it had to be field, a fieldable system. You need to be able to take it out in the field and operate it. And when I mean the field, we don't, we don't set it out in the grass and run it, but in a, in a facility that's near a location where you want to uh, take samples, you will, the, the concept of operations is you grab samples and bring them back to this unit, but the unit would be located close to the uh, area that you want to make your measurements. Um, I'll get to sample types in a second, but that's going to be uh, important. Um, but going through the, the chart on the right, these are our key, pr key um, processing parameters. The, these are the, the primary requirements that had to be met for the system, although we, had a, we have a whole list of requirements uh, that are not key to the system operation, but that we wanted to meet to make sure that it, it met, met our operational goals. Um, I'll say the count time, I'll point out count time of 12 hours and variable. And I'll also point out we have a threshold, which is the minimum objectives. That's, that's the basics that we want to meet. But we also had objectives, which if we can do better than the threshold, get down to better levels, we, we listed those as what would our, our optimal goals be. 
but we wanted 12 hours count time to be able to meet our MDC. And we, our MDC is really the only thing different between, in this chart, between our threshold and objective. But for a 12 hour count, two liter sample, we'd like to have got 15 millibecquerels per standard cubic meter. And our objective was 10 millibecquerels per standard cubic meter. Um, it's for soil gas, that's as far as we can all understand, based a lot on what Roland's done and a lot of the background work we've done. Um, 10, becquerel, 10 millibecquerels is probably adequate. It's, it's above atmospheric levels, but in the soil gas, um, measurements have been made anywhere from 10, 10 millibecquerels up to 100 millibecquerels in natural backgrounds. So we think we're right in the background range with that, that level of um, activity. And so the next line is also processing with and without a xenon system. And, and again, this, this refers back to the, the last point I made about having xenon and argon in the same measurement. If we can get it out of, if we can make an argon and xenon measurement out of the same air mass, then our confidence goes up significantly. So we wanted to be able to take the stream of a, uh, the output stream, waste stream I'll call it, of a xenon system and put it into the argon system so we have exactly the same air mass. Um, we wanted complete automated control of the system and need to be able to uh, access it and run it remotely or locally. So the air sample types, we wanted, before I jump to that, we wanted to make sure that we could run high pressure cylinders such as scuba tanks that would be collected in the field and brought back to the system. We wanted to make sure we could uh, run Tedler bags of air that would be collected. And we want to also be able to run atmospheric air samples for backgrounds. So I'll get into the system specifics here and um, go through, I'm going to go through the functionality of the system as you connect a sample through the processing steps. So this, this is our sample inlet module. Um, you can see there's six sample inlets and you can, you can bring six samples to the system, connect them through a quick connect and hit run Put, put your runtime parameters in, hit run, and the system will run through sample after sample until all six are processed and counted. And I will say we'll, we have seven nuclear detectors on the system, which we'll see later in the talk. Um, but in, anyways, we can run, you can have a mixture of uh, scuba tanks, pressurized scuba tanks, bags, and air on this. It doesn't matter. You'll set it up in the control system as, as you come up to the system, which, which type of sample you have, and it'll process any of those, those types of samples. Um, we have a basic water removal um, system. It's just a Nafion dryer. Nafion dryers are commercially available. It's just uh, you have sulfonate channels that the water passes through. Um, but we do dry the samples because we, we have found in the field that water content varies significantly, and it can, pr it can disrupt the process later down the, f down the stream although it, it's not critical that water is removed in this process. It just helps stabilize the process. So we have a uh, Nafion dryer system that uh, removes water. So to remove nitrogen, which is the next step, nitrogen is 78% of the, the, air, uh, the contents in air, and we need to remove all of the nitrogen. So we developed a process, we call it a dual reflux um, pressure swing absorption system, and it's in t typical pressure swing absorption systems, you pressurize the first column and uh, depressurize the second column and you switch back and forth and you remove things like water and carbon dioxide in, in a typical pressure swing system. The way this is set up, there's four columns and our compressor is in between the two, um, two sets of columns. It acts much more like a distillation column than a pressure swing system. And we, if, if somebody wants to talk about it later, be happy to. I won't get into the details of the process. But what this process does is it removes the nitrogen um, pretty quantitatively. It also removes water and CO2 and most of the heavy noble gases, the, the krypton and the radon, which we need to eliminate in the process. The next step, we need to get rid of the oxygen. and for everybody who's worked on argon understands, o oxygen and argon are extremely difficult to separate. 
Um, we do use proportional counters in the system, and so we cannot have any oxygen left in the system. So we took a two-stage approach to remove the oxygen, and we have a, a bulk oxygen removal capability and then a, a, um, a trace removal, uh, uh, oxygen removal system. So the bulk oxygen is removed by cobalt oxide. It's a chemical reaction where oxygen reacts with cobalt at 700 degrees C. And uh, the cobalt traps are shown over on the right here. Um, you've got cobalt disc that we've built that uh, load, load into, the, into the traps. And those are all placed in a heater. And that heater, it's insulated well enough that at 700 degrees, it's just warm to the touch on the outside. To regenerate it, we run it at 900 degrees. So it is hot, but the, the insulation is, per, is very, very good. Anyways, oxygen's removed um, down into the parts per million level with, with the cobalt oxide. Now, to remove the trace amounts of oxygen that might get into the detector and still disrupt the detector, um, we use, it's basically a fuel cell, and I'll say it's run in reverse. And that's shown in this bottom picture here. This is a classic fuel cell. Um, the way the fuel cells work, if we remember our chemistry, you would, you would put your hydrogen in the middle, um, you would diffuse your oxygen through, through the, uh, typically it's the uh, yttria stabilized zirconia, and the oxygen then would um, react with the hydrogen. You get electrons out in the, in the reduction, and, and uh, ooh, three minutes, I better get moving. Um, so <clears throat> anyways, we, put a, we apply a current to the, um, to the, uh, system and we drive oxygen from low concentration to high concentration and what what basically what this does then is it takes the low concentration of hydrogen oxygen I'm sorry oxygen that that's that remains from the cobalt and we drive it out of the column and we can get down to less than parts per million at low, low parts per billion with this process um, so we we also then w once at, at the exit of that stage we have, we have obtained a, a fairly pure stream of argon. We've removed nitrogen and oxygen. Um, we then run the trap through uh, a, a cold trap just to remove, if there, in case there's any nitrogen, any heavy gases, krypton or radon, through a lithium LSX trap. And this was, this was based on a design from Robin Reedman, who's in the, in the uh, audience here, who came over and worked with us on developing this technique to remove the trace gases. They use it for bulk purification of, of argon in their lab at University of Bern with, with Roland Pritchard. Um, but anyways, uh, what we do is run the gas through a cold trap of lithium LSX, removes the heavies, and then we freeze the argon down onto a cold trap. The cold trap is just a metal cold trap it's at minus 220 degrees C. We use a Stirling cooler to cool it down under vacuum conditions. The argon will collect on that trap. From, from, the, collection, we, uh, from the collection, then we'll, we'll expand the gas out, quantify how much argon is, is in the system, and we then refreeze the gas. We use the quantification of argon to figure out how much, how much methane will go into the proportional counter. We load methane to the proportional counter, then we add the, we expand the uh, argon off the frozen trap into the proportional counter. We end up with the P10 mixture, 10% methane and 90% uh, argon for measurement. And you can see the traps here. This is separation and that's purification. Um, the proportional counters we've developed and you, at PNNL over the last 15, 20 years. Craig Alseth has a lot of publications on, on, the, on these detectors. These were special built for this argon system. They're 250 cc detectors um, built out of <coughs> o, um, OFHC copper. It's, it's pure copper. And um, there, as you can see, there's an array of seven different detectors. Um, let's see. This is a design of the, the um, electronics. We have the preamplifier boards, the detectors, 
and uh, we have veto panels, lead shields, and you can see the detectors here. And the last slide, we, through all of our testing, we did generate samples that were at 10 millibecquerels per standard cubic meter to, to see if we could meet our, our requirement, our key requirement. And as you can see, the 2.8 kV peak here, we were able to hit the 10 millibecquerels per standard cubic meter with, with high confidence, 7.8 sigma, 0.8 sigma above background. Last slide. A little over, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. One question? Any question? Yes, please. Thanks, Ian, for a great talk and a very great system. Just wondered if you could share your thoughts on what you want to do with this system in the near and the long term. What, what, how are you going to use it? What are your plans? Uh, yeah, thanks. So right now, we're, this system, we've run several hundred runs on the system. <coughs> and the reason is we're supporting many different projects at PNNL. You saw the UNESCO program project that that Christine briefed and the Argon 39 that Brian briefed. Um, so we're, we're running a lot of system, a lot of samples for different projects. Uh, we expect to continue. W the stuff that I didn't talk about, and maybe I can talk about that at Inga, is we're doing a lot of atmospheric background and soil gas backgrounds to really to better understand the backgrounds. Because it's one thing that, as Brian showed, we, we do not understand the backgrounds. And there's always something that's going to come out. So. In the immediate future, we need to really uh, stress the system, but also start working at uh, getting a better understanding of atmospheric and soil gas backgrounds. Any collaboration you want to do, though, we're happy, happy to work with you. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we would like to move on to the next uh, the topics. Uh, the how useful are the quantum uh, technology, gravity measures, measurements for the on-site inspection. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bodis, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dan. Uh, I work for the University of Birmingham, but I'm also on the third training cycle of on-site inspectors. Imagine you're in a very dark room. You can't move around, and you want to find out where the walls are. How would you do that? You could reach down, you could pick up a rock, and you could throw the rock at the wall. And when it hits the wall, it'll make a sound. You could stand and you can hear that. This is exactly how most of the geophysical techniques we use on on-site inspection work, what we call active techniques. So the instrument at the surface puts a signal into the ground, whether that's electromagnetic radiation or something similar, uh, and then it, it reaches the wall, it reaches the, the, the object you're looking for, in this case a wall, uh, and it, it induces some kind of response which we can also measure at the surface. There's a problem. Imagine you're in a much bigger room Again, you throw your rock, but you can't quite throw it far enough to hit the wall. This is again similar to a lot of our active techniques. If you, if you, throw the, uh, if you induce a signal into the ground, the ground is naturally attenuates that signal and makes it more difficult to actually uh, reach the target, what we call a, a depth of penetration limitation. How might you go about doing something about that? Well, gravity works very differently uh, because gravity is a passive technique. That is, instead of a wall, we now have a speaker. When you were walking here to the conference today, none of you floated up in the air. Gravity is always there. We can't turn it off. All we have to do is listen for it. So if the speaker's there and the signal's coming out, all we have is we have to listen. Now, if the, the signal's very quiet, maybe we need something more sensitive than the human ear. So we could replace it with a microphone, um, a very sensitive microphone. So for gravity, what might that microphone look like? 
This is what the microphone might look like. One of our quantum technology sensors that we've been developing at the University of Birmingham uh, with commercial partners like RSK and Teldyne E2V. Um, yeah. Um, Basically, it works using quantum technology, uh, which is very complicated, and I'm going to deliberately avoid talking about last thing in the conference. The question is, if this instrument is 10 times more sensitive than the instruments we already have, is it 10 times better at detecting OSI-relevant observables? No. <laughs> the trouble is, when you're in the room, the, the speaker isn't the only thing there. There's always going to be sources of noise. There's always going to be other things going on in the room. In the case of microgravity, this might be microseismic noise, it might be the effects of tides, there's all sorts of things going on, and we can only detect things if we can hear them above all that noise. One of the advantages we have with quantum technology is we can stack two sensors on top of each other and take a gradiometer measurement. This is good because a lot of the noise sources you see will, will be the same on both sensors and therefore will cancel out when we subtract them from each other. So what are we looking for in an on-site inspection? Um, well, there's two different types of emplacement we might potentially have. Uh, the first of these is a vertical installation. That is, you drill a hole into the ground from the surface uh, and put the bomb in vertically and just hang it there until it goes off. Um, and that, that, that might explode and create a load of, of potential observables, uh, which you see here. So you might get a sort of a, a blast chamber where the bomb's gone off. You might get a, a sort of chamber where it collapses or an, ap an apical void. Um, you might get a crater at the surface. You'll certainly probably get some cracks depending on the geology. And it, it, it's which of these we can find using this. The second type of installation is a horizontal installation, <coughs> which you see here. Um, this is where, essentially, there's a hole drilled into the side of a hill or some kind of feature, uh, and the bomb's put in horizontally that way. Um, again, a lot of the features are the same, but now we also have a tunnel feature, um, which might be important to find on an on-site inspection to gather the facts that the perpetrator has set off a nuclear explosion. How do we go about working this out, given that the, the instruments we have are largely... Um, prototypes, not quite there yet. Um, well, we have to do some computer simulations. Um, these were actually very complicated, but the simple version is this. We take, the, we take the anomaly, we simplify it to a geometric shape and work out the gravity effect of that. We add some simulated noise, um, which we, we simulate, and then we try and realistically correct it. So we correct that noise imperfectly to hopefully leave us a, a, a good outcome that looks similar to what we would get in reality. Um, to, in order to study this, um, I use something called the name and Pearson decision rule, uh, which is essentially, there's a link between the signal to noise ratio you have, um, any a, a probability of a false detection, and the probable chance of you detecting it. So. I took these things together to create these, these rather nifty detectability maps that you see here. Um, so the top one, there, that is our existing instrument. Uh, this is the Syntrex. It's a spring-based gravimeter that we use on on-site inspections. Uh, this is what it's capable of the, in terms of the, the radius of the tunnel it might be able to detect uh, and the depth at which it might be able to detect it. So. I, I, I sort of yellow colors uh, mean we can probably detect it, and the, the sort of the darker colors mean we probably can't. So we're, we're kind of limited. We don't detect very much in the, in the sort of like the, uh, unless it's very big, basically. We're, we're looking at the, the, the big things. It can't detect anything smaller than about three meters. Um, if we were to use a quantum technology gravimeter, that is, one of our quantum technology sensors with only one sensor. Um, we get a slight improvement, but it's not, it's not massive. Um, the real game changer is when we put them in a uh, gradiometer uh, configuration. Um, you begin to see that even, even down here, 
with the, the smaller voids. At, at quite shallow depths, we can still see them. So we, we, we've definitely got a sort of improvement down this end. Um, how do we quantify that? Um, well, if we take a sort of 75% chance of detection, um, and what uh, at different depths you see here, um, what's the smallest feature we could detect? Um, you can see we've got a slight improvement on the gravimeter. It's roughly about 12% in most of those cases, um, which is good. But the real game changer is using the gradiometer, um, where you can see certainly for shallower objects, uh, we've got quite a, qu we're quite a bit better. We're between sort of 15 and 50% better in terms of the size of the object we can detect. Um, for the collapse chambers, similar kind of story. Um, we probably don't get quite, quite as, as, as much advantage out of it, but a little bit down the bottom end. Um, here we go. Again, if we take the, the smaller size object, we could potentially detect. Um, again, there's a 5 to 10% better chance of detecting it with quantum technology gravimeter. Uh, but a 20 to 25 percent chance of, of getting a better result with the QT gradiometer. Um, where it doesn't work in each of these cases is it's not particularly good at deep objects. Um, that's because by taking the, the derivative of the signal, you automatically reduce the signal as well as the noise a little bit. So we have to have a much more sensitive detector to detect it. Finally, the sort of circular blast chambers. Um, this is highlighted very clearly here that this does a much better job at detecting things down here, sort of uh, small radius things at shallow depths, but once you get below a certain depth of about sort of 20 meters or so, it, it's not terribly useful. Um, again, we've got a 10 to 15 percent better result from the, the gravimeter, uh, but 35 to 40 percent better for the QD gradiometer where it's still working. Uh, but it stops working sort of after about 20 meters or so. Um, so to conclude this, basically the gradiometer is very good for shallow targets. It'll increase the speed at which we can operate in the field, and it'll increase the accuracy um, because of this noise cancelling ability. Um, but it's, it's quite poor at deeper targets, uh, and we need to think about how we do something about that. Um, it may well be that there's a different configuration we can use, Maybe we can cancel the noise by using two of them next to each other. Um, maybe there's another noise reduction method. This isn't my day job. I work in civil engineering, um, but I, I like thinking about these things. So I'm sure I'll come up with something. And I, I, finally, I believe this work's important because I think it's important to send a message at, um, if the treaty ever comes into force and someone is going to try and hide one of these uh, nuclear explosions. We will find you. However small you try and do it, we'll get you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bodis. Any questions and co comments? Please. Hi, I'm Campbell Smith at the PTS. Uh, a lot of gravity systems require quite a lot of settling time or they require uh, very low temperatures. Are there any sort of practicalities to, to using this technique? Um, we're still working on them. Uh, essentially, currently they take a little bit of time to sort of settle and turn the lasers on and get the ion pumps working and all that kind of stuff that the physicists do that I don't understand. Um, I believe when they actually come in, they'll be a lot more stable than the spring-based ones. Um, if only because they don't drift, at least on a, an operational level. Um, so they, I, they should be actually more, more robust than, than the existing ones when the, when the technology reaches maturity, but it's kind of early days at the moment. So we, we won't really know until we, until we sort of finally get them working and out in the field regularly. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wades. Thank you. <clears throat>
Okay, the, the next uh, presentation is going to be seismically cute antineutrino detectors have limit potential to monitor nuclear explosion. Dr. Carr, please. Well, I'm glad to have this chance to say a little more about an idea that was discussed in the session yesterday. Uh, so this is a long title. Let me uh, break it into a few pieces. I'll um, start by just reminding you of the antineutrino signal from fission explosions and the type of detectors that could, in principle, observe that signal. Then I'll introduce this simple concept of seismic queuing, which is an attempt to try to make the detector volumes a little more tractable and try to put the information that we might get from the signal in the international monitoring system context. Um, but ultimately, I'll conclude by explaining why uh, this technique and probably any technique that's based on antineutrinos, while interesting from a particle physics standpoint, uh, probably has very limited potential to practically contribute to the monitoring of nuclear explosions. So we've known since the early days of nuclear testing that fission explosions produce a huge number of antineutrinos. These come from <clears throat> the beta decay of fission fragments, about six per fission, which works out to about 10 to the 24 per kiloton of yield. And they come in a kind of burst with a long tail. You can see uh, in the simulation that we did of the antineutrino emission in the first minute after a nominal fission explosion. Uh, it turns out that of the detectable antineutrinos, about two-thirds are in the first 10 seconds after the detonation. They're emitted isotropically, and uh, their hallmark is that they're extremely weakly interacting, which means they travel through the rock around an underground explosion, uh, through the ocean, the, through the diameter of the Earth, uh, and unfortunately through most detectors without leaving a trace. We've, we've never actually had a detection of an antineutrino from a fission explosion. Uh, in principle, we know how to do it because we've detected millions of antineutrinos from another fission source, nuclear reactors. I was actually at a plutonium production reactor in the US where a team of former weapon scientists detected the first neutrino of any kind. Uh, and the channel that they used, inverse beta decay, is still the way that we would try to detect antineutrinos from a fission explosion today. Uh, they were able to use a small simulator detector because they were very close to a reactor. But for trying to detect antineutrinos from a fission explosion at a long distance, probably the only practical detector medium is water. Um, and the largest existing liquid water-based antineutrino or neutrino detector uh, is actually very large. Uh, this is a Super Kamio Kane detector. It's buried a kilometer underground inside a mountain in Japan. Uh, the active volume is about 25,000 tons of water, total volume sort of twice that. Large detector, you can see a, a few scientists on a little boat here going around to clean the photomultiplier tubes. This detector cost about $100 million to build in the 90s, and it's produced great science. This is one of the places where, uh, by observing neutrinos from cosmic rays, we learned the surprising fact that neutrinos have mass. Uh, and building on that great science, Japan is actually planning to build an even larger neutrino detector that's 10 times the volume of Super Kamio Kande. This is called Hyper Kamio Kande. Uh, it's about a $2 billion project. Uh, the dimensions are kind of the scale of the US Capitol. And um, this is supported by the Japanese government. This is the top priority for high energy physics in Japan. So given the fact that these physics detectors are now reaching these really enormous scales, we thought, you know, it's not totally inconceivable that one of these detectors could detect an antineutrino from a fission explosion, especially since these detectors, uh, this one in particular, plan to be in Japan, so not so far from North Korea. Um, so we thought, you know, may maybe this deserves another look. <laughs> um, but, but that leads to a few more questions. If the antineutrino signal from a fission explosion was detected in a detector like this, how would we know that it came from a fission explosion, not from a nearby nuclear reactor or some other background source? Uh, and more importantly, would that antineutrino signal, especially if it's small, have anything practical to offer uh, to CTBT monitoring? 
And so this is where the, the concept of seismic queuing comes in. So um, we assume that any fission explosion that would detect an observable antineutrino signal would also detect an observable uh, seismic signal. And from that seismic signal, we know we can infer the, the hypothetical detonation time to within a few seconds. Uh, what we can't conclusively say, of course, is that the signal came from a nuclear explosion. Uh, that's why we go through the trouble of trying to detect radionuclides. So the idea, at least with antineutrinos here, is uh, they are also intrinsically nuclear. So if we can detect the antineutrino signature, maybe that's a possible substitute for what radionuclides usually provide. Um, and, and the way we do this is by taking that detonation time, using it as uh, a cue or sort of analysis trigger to look back in the data stream of a suitably large and well-positioned antineutrino detector. And if we look in a very specific, say, 10-second window right after that detonation time, as long as the background rate in the detector is reasonable, uh, if there is a signal in this specific window, uh, one can say with rigorous statistical uh, basis that uh, those antineutrinos came from the same event as appeared in the seismic data, and that event was nuclear in nature. So this is the idea of seismic queuing of an antineutrino detector. And we, we wanted then to see if this idea, which is maybe a little easier than trying to detect a uh, fission explosion that's uh, below the seismic threshold, we wanted to see if this had any practical implications. So we asked for a given fission yield observed from a given distance, how large would a water-based antineutrino detector need to be in order to confirm most of the time uh, that that signal came from a fission event uh, at high confidence? And we assessed this using the best, most realistic conservative signal and background models that we could develop for large water detectors. Um, and the answer, maybe not surprisingly, is that even with this seismic queuing trick, the size of the detectors that you need is extremely large. Uh, so what we show here is four uh, nominal fission yields, uh, these different curves. As you get farther from the explosion, obviously the mass of the detector you need to confirm the fission nature of that explosion increases. Uh, the discrete jumps here come from the fact that you actually don't need that many antineutrinos based on the background rates. Um, and then the, the wiggles are from this interesting fact that neutrinos change flavor as they propagate. Um, in any case, just to give a, a few specific examples from this plot, uh, if you remember that detector that I showed that's the size of the U.S. Capitol, Hyper-K, that's represented by um, this size, uh, this line, top line here. So if we wanted to use that detector to confirm the fission nature of a 25 kiloton uh, explosion, we would only be able to take that capability out to about 100 kilometers. So this detector is planned to be here in Japan, 100 kilometers is not even all the way to Tokyo. Um, if we wanted to try to confirm the fission nature of even the largest of the North Korean nuclear tests, say generously 250 kilotons fission yield, uh, we would need a detector that's about 10 times the size of Hyper-K, that planned detector. So 100 times the size of the existing detector that you saw the little boat in. And this is sort of a $10 billion scale project. So already, um, as we were hearing a little bit yesterday, much more expensive than the entire existing IMS. Maybe more modestly, if we tried to look at using antineutrino detectors for test site transparency, uh, this is also really challenging trying to confirm the fission nature of even a 250-ton explosion, so not super low yield, uh, over a radius of a few kilometers, you need a detector that is uh, at the several tens of millions of dollars scale. And as my colleague Michael Fox pointed out yesterday, you could probably do this kind of test site transparency with um, you know, gas detectors for, for a much lower cost. So I think Ultimately, we, we have to conclude that even as these physics detectors are getting very large, uh, and it's conceivable that an antineutrino or two might be incidentally detected from a, a future test, the potential for practically applying this technology to nuclear explosion detection is still extremely limited 
uh, by detector size and obviously cost. So I, I completely concur with the conclusion that Michael Fox presented yesterday, and I hope you had a chance to look at his poster uh, with some more cost comparisons. You can see some more details of the study that we did um, in a recent paper. We looked also at the possibility of using antineutrinos to constrain the, the yield, uh, to quantify the yield of a test or to differentiate fission from fusion. Um, but bottom line there is that the detector sizes are even larger than what I just showed you. So from these big neutrino detectors, I hope we'll continue to get interesting basic physics, but I think probably not in any foreseeable way uh, any capability for nuclear test monitoring. Thanks. There are some questions? Uh, what anti-neutrino uh, background? So um, backgrounds for this type of study include the antineutrinos produced by nuclear reactors, which is significant, for example, in this Northeast Asia region, um, antineutrinos from radioactive decay in the Earth crust and mantle, we call geoneutrinos. Um, then there are backgrounds for this type of signal that are not actually from neutrinos, um, cosmogenic isotopes, et cetera. So all of that is included in this analysis. You mentioned that water was the best way to detect these. So given that there's an ocean between Japan and Korea, <clears throat> wouldn't that make it rather unlikely that you detect it in Japan, you need your detector in, like, in South Korea? So are you thinking about attenuation of the, of the neutrino signal in water? I mean, basically, the, the, you can think of the neutrino signal as being effectively unattenuated. The interaction is so low that you know, the rate is sort of roughly constant, um, you know, it goes off as inverse square law, um, but, but no attenuation beyond that. If you're trying to use the ocean as a detector, you know, which is an idea people have thought about, I mean, that's, that's just difficult because of the purity of the water, trying to get low energy Sure, signals. I just was thinking if water is the active detection medium, <clears throat> and you have billions of gallons of it between the site and the, the actual detector. Wouldn't yeah, that's, that's not a problem. Uh, not the, a problem. The, the neutrino flux just goes through it, yeah. I see. Uh, how does your analysis compare uh, with the uh, work done to uh, point to the use of anti-neutrino detectors close to nuclear reactors where, as I understand it, you, you could see that the reactor was on or off? If you, uh, are there detectors uh, that are used for that that you could, for example, put at a test site to see whether or not a, a nuclear explosion uh, you illustrated it? a quarter of a kiloton, but even lower down into the tons lane range you might see based on whatever that technology is as opposed to whatever you're talking about. Uh, so, so the question of whether antineutrino detectors can be used to monitor reactors, which is part of what you're talking about, is a really good one. And certainly there's a lot more potential there, at least for being close to a reactor, than for trying to detect fission explosions. But I think what you're asking is, can we use any of the technology from these reactor experiments to, to try to make this more tractable? And the answer is no. I mean, this really, it, so essentially it is the technology that, that I'm showing here. It's inverse beta decay. That's a detection channel. There are different media you can use, whether it's water scintillator. It doesn't make a huge difference um, in the amount of signal that you're going to detect. So, yeah, that doesn't help. It's still an interesting question about wh whether, for a reactor source, a relatively small antineutrino detector can provide some, uh, some reactor monitoring benefit. I think that's still an open question. Thanks. Thank you very much, Raquel. And we'll go to the next presentation, which is the feasibility of using MEMS technology for monitoring large earthquakes. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. A shift to a pure seismic topic. Um, 
I remember uh, there was a panel discussion in previous SNT uh, dealing with the subject that it is uh, useful to use, it is possible to use MEMS technology to detect seismic signals or not. Actually, this presentation um, is uh, the results of our studies during past years to share our uh, data uh, about using MEMS technology to take large earthquakes. Okay, um, um, to measure acceleration in engineering seismology, uh, we can divide it into two different classes to measure weak motion measurement, uh, which is uh, for structural health monitoring and site effect measurements in the context of engineering seismology, not pure seismology. Um, for a structural health monitoring, it is usually necessary to measure ambient noise, so uh, ambient vibration, so it is really necessary to have high dynamic range sensors. But for strong motion measurements, for post-earthquake inspections, um, calculating shake maps, damage maps, fatality maps, and rapid response applications like shut-off systems of uh, uh, water supplies, gas uh, supplies, um, it seems it is possible to use MEMS technology. For the first kind, um, the application is very ad hoc. For example, we want to measure uh, the structural characteristics of a, a structure, so we go and deploy uh, high dynamic range sensors for that specific structure and measure uh, the vibration of the structure uh, excited against ambient vibrations. For such kind of applications, it is necessary to have dynamic range of sensors more than 140 decibel. But, but I want to emphasize that uh, for such application, it is usually necessary to use a small number of sensors. However, for a strong motion measurements, uh, because we don't know when earthquake will occur, uh, it is usually to deploy constantly uh, the sensors uh, and constantly measures uh, the vibration. Um, but most uh, important uh, thing is uh, the number of sensors. If it is possible to increase number of sensors to hundreds, thousands of sensors in order to have some idea of a cloud of sensors, uh, it would be much uh, useful um, to uh, calculate for calculation of shake maps and uh, um, casualty maps, fatality maps, and damage maps in the context of earthquake engineering. And for such application, it seems that uh, dynamic ranges uh, less than 100 decibel could be sufficient. A question. Uh, is it possible to use MEMS technology to record the strong motion of larger earthquakes for engineering seismology purposes? And why MEMS? Actually, this presentation is a pursuit uh, for the answer of the first question. And why MEMS? Because it's cheap. Uh, it's um, much cheaper than conventional force balance uh, seismometers, and it is possible to, de to, to deploy hundreds of sensors uh, in a location. We have started to actually uh, build uh, a three-dimensional uh, accelerometers uh, using uh, MEMS technology. Uh, I want to uh, uh, actually notice you for this number, which is self-noise. The, the common problem with uh, MEMS sensors is the self-noise high level of self-noise. And we use uh, a stacking uh, uh, algorithm uh, uh, for reducing the self-noise inside, uh, sorry, inside the sensor. After that, the question was about verification. Uh, we did lots of shaking table tests uh, using uh, different kind of sensors, for example, these are our sensors, these are CMG5U accelerometers from Gural. Uh, this is CMG5T, the accelerometer, 
accelerometer again from Gurov. This is another actually MEMS accelerometer. Uh, this is epicensor uh, from Kinematrics. So um, we perform lots of shaking table tests to verify uh, uh, the methodology that we use uh, in our sensors. Um, for cross axis sensitivity and for tilt test, we uh, actually um, made another uh, uh, instrument to measure uh, those parameters. For uh, checking the accuracy of internal clock of the sensor, uh, for uh, measuring the sensitivity of the sensor against temperature. Uh, both the sensitivity of the internal clock and the sensitivity of the sensor. Uh, we put the sensor in the refrigerator and in the oven uh, and uh, test uh, uh, the accuracy of the sensor up to the temperature of 70 and 80 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, and also uh, the resistance of the sensor against water. It's a column of water and we put sensor for a week under uh, one meter height of the water column um, and to see what would be the consequences. After that, uh, we uh, test the sensor in real applications. For example, for measuring the vibration of a bridge, a railroad bridge, uh, when, when uh, uh, the uh, actually train uh, goes um, uh, from the bridge and uh, we uh, actually installed our sensors uh, in collocated with other sensors and measured the vibrations of the bridge and um, everything was good and what was uh, the subject of uh, my presentation is uh, measuring the vibration of a small dam, a small concrete dam located uh, near border of Iran and Iraq uh, against a large uh, uh, earthquake uh, that took place two years ago uh, near this location. Installation of hat sensors in Hirvi Dam. Uh, it is a dam on uh, Maroon uh, River. Uh, it is uh, uh, the pictures, the photos of the dam. It's a small dam actually. Um, uh, we installed the sensors uh, in uh, 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 some boxes to make another protection against environmental uh, uh, factors. Uh, and we installed five uh, different sectors, uh, sensors in uh, different locations of the dam. One in Freefield, another one on the crest of the dam, another one in the uh, uh, right abutment, left abutment, and uh, the basement of the dam. Uh, fortunately, for the sake of testing, unfortunately, uh, um, we had a magnitude 7.3 earthquake uh, near the uh, location of the Hirvi Dam with some 38 kilometers um, from the epicenter of the earthquake. So that earthquake provides us uh, a very good opportunity to test the uh, actually functionality of the sensors in real application, in real test. Um, one thing was uh, recording uh, the signals from the main shock. Another thing was uh, the ability to uh, record thousands of uh, aftershocks, the signals of thousands of aftershocks from these earthquakes. Okay, uh, these are the waveforms and the PGA values. The PGA values uh, are, I'm sorry, it's Side down because I converted from my Mac to uh, actually uh, PowerPoint. It is a centimeter per square uh, second. Um, in left, abut left abut 
abutment, crest, right abutment, basement, and free field, and it is possible to calculate the amplification of the uh, signals in different locations of the dam. And this is the amplification uh, curves uh, relative to free field and relative to foundation uh, of the dam and uh, in uh, uh, east-west direction, the amplification reads as much as seven times uh, in this frequency band. And this is also the trajectory, uh, the particle motions, um, uh, the acceleration, velocity, and displacement. It is possible to um, uh, plot the trajectory of different location, uh, trajectory of uh, of different locations of the dam. Uh, another thing was uh, the capability of the sensor to record the aftershocks. Uh, we select uh, some samples from aftershocks of uh, that earthquake uh, with magnitude 4.4, 4.7, some 5.4, and uh, for this uh, aftershock, uh, I will show you the uh, waveform uh, recorded by the uh, by these sensors in uh, distance nearly 45 kilometers from the epicenter of the aftershock. This is this is actually the uh, waveform. For sure, it is noisy because uh, it is a MEMS technology. It is the self noise of the sensor, but it is possible to capture the PGA, peak ground acceleration uh, of the record, and for many scientific, uh, thank you, for many, sci for many engineering and engineering seismology applications, it's, it's enough to have the peak value, uh, uh, to have the response of the structures against that peak value. To conclude, uh, it is possible to use MEMS technology for engineering seismology applications like calculation of shake map or damage maps. Uh, low price of these sensors makes it possible to use a large number of them in real applications. Uh, when I say large number, I refer to hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, MEMS sensors. It is possible to use them in real application, and it is possible to use stacking methods for reducing as uh, uh, noise and uh, increasing signal to noise ratio. However, I want to emphasize that low dynamic range of these sensors is not suitable for most seismology applications because uh, if I uh, come back to this figure, uh, you can see that it is not possible to uh, actually capture the uh, P phase arrival uh, for this aftershock because. Uh, the self noise of the sensor is high, that uh, the low amplitude P phase ROI wall is uh, hidden uh, in the self noise of the sensor. So, we shall be uh, realistic. For some applications, it is possible to use MEMS technology, but for uh, uh, locating earthquakes, maybe it is not possible. Uh, for, for with conventional methods, maybe with cross correlation or something like that, it is possible to use. Um, this technology as well. And thank you. There's an, any question? Hi. <coughs> What's the long term drift stability like on these? Long term? sort of over a number of days, like how much do they drift? Uh, you, you refer to actually life cycle of the uh, sensors. Okay, that's another important thing because the maintenance, uh, 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 the requirement for maintenance for this kind of sensors is much lower than conventional sensors. Uh, because uh, um, uh, they can work for a long uh, time of, uh, for long duration of time. Uh, now we test them for 
uh, about six years without any need for uh, replacement or maintenance. But uh, for force balance sensor, it is usually to actually uh, have some kind of calibration, some kind of replacement, something like that. And most important is uh, the deployment of the sensor. For high dynamic range sensor, it is necessary to make them isolated from, for temperature, uh, changes of the weather. But for this kind of sensor, it is less sensitive to uh, changes in temperature. So from that point of view, yes, it is also more feasible to use these sensors. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the last presentation of today is uh, using the existing telecommunication optical fiber cables as underwater seismic event detectors. Good morning, my dear colleagues. Morning. My name is Yuri Pashko. I'm glad to represent to you the main central special monitoring and work for and which is located in Ukraine. In our organization, we always try to find new ways how to improve the process of seismic conservation. We also study different sensor technologies and try to implement them so as to extend the existing equipment capabilities. To be honest, we are on the very first steps in what I'm going to describe today. That's why my oral presentation will be rather theoretical than practical. The idea I'm going to describe is well known, of course. Nevertheless, it might be quite in interesting for the task of seismic monitoring. So the idea still needs considering, studying, and developing as well. They would help to improve the quality of geophysical monitoring process in general. So the work is go on. Let me go to describe the idea. Uh, detecting uh, ocean flow seismic activity is crucial for our understanding of the internal structure and dynamic behavior of the Earth. <coughs> However, about 70% of the planet's surface is covered by water, and the seismometry's coverage is limited to a handful of per permanent ocean bottom stations. As a small a seismometer, a single one, sits on the only location in the record ground motion only in that point. We are also limited in where we can install seismometers. It will be shown that existing telecommunication optic fiber cables can detect, uh, can detect seismic events when combined with frequency metrology, metrology techniques by using the fiber itself as a sensing element. Fiber optic cables have some advantages over <coughs> the seismometer most commonly used to monitor earthquakes today. Since uh, the any urban en environmental change affects the light in the intensity, phase, and uh, polarization in ways uh, that can be detected at the other end of the fiber. The optical data cables, including the network, are deployed for communications purpose or to pick up seismic signals, signals from the remote earthquakes and the wave movement in the ocean as well. Um, I would like you to uh, look at this diagram in order to go on. There are approximately one million kilometers of fiber optic cable thrown across the bottom of the world's ocean, carrying internet and telecom, cal telecom traffic. In addition to effort, there should be a way to use them as seismic, detector, uh, seismic detectors. They are expected to be a small slow down in signal delivery due to tiny vibration caused by remote earthquakes bending the light. That makes the idea of looking into using such cables as seismic detectors. The, cable, the cables should be used as seismic detectors without disruption to service and without having to make any change to the cables. All that will be needed would be to, uh, all that would be needed would be to gain access to one of the group of channels in both edges of the cable. To use a fiber optic telecommunication cable as a seismic sensor, a light source such a laser should be ingested, injected into one end of the optical fiber 
and the light that uh, exits at the other end of the cable should be monitored. When a seismic wave rattles the cable, it distorts the laser light traveling through it. By comparing the original laser, laser signal with the light that exits the cable, it must be determined how much the beam was distor distorted along the way, and therefore, the strength of the se seismic wave that strummed the cable. When the fiber length changes due to an incident seismic wave of some other effect, it produces a corresponding phase delay in the box cutting pulse, which can be detected. When the fiber is deformed, we will see distortion in the box cutting light. And from this distortion, we can measure how the fiber itself is being squeezed or pulled. So uh, we can see quite an analogy to an ordinal uh, seismic detector. The light signal might be analyzed and compared to data sets from the dense network of seismographs. And uh, I would like you to put your attention to the following diagram again. Distributed vibration sensing, DVS, also known as distributed acoustic sensing, DIS, is a relative new method for recording seismic data using a standard fiber optic cables as a sensor. This is a technology that measures acoustic or seismic wire fields by shooting short laser pulses across the length of the fiber. DIS involves connecting a laser interrogator unit to one end of the used fiber optic cables. In contrast to uh, conventional arrays then consist of special discrete electronic sensors. A DIS system utilizes a single optoelectronic interrogator unit uh, the, that can uh, sample tens of kilometers of optical fibers at a submeter channel spacing. One end of the fiber need, needs to be physically accessible. So so that there should be a place where the laser pulse can be initiated. But the rest of the fiber can be anywhere, on the bottom of the ocean in particular. The interrogator uh, shoots laser light pulses into the cable and then monitors by scattered photons. The portions of that light reflected back towards the source from different points along the cable, as you can see on the diagram. Any stretching or bending of the cable due to ground vibration from ocean waves or an earthquake, for an example, alters the path of the box scattering photons. By measuring these changes, we can piece together information about the strain on segments of the cable over time and quantify the speed and direction of the seismic waves responsible. Tiny impurities on the fiber case, case is, uh, cause the laser light to scatter. If the fiber is stationary, the backscatter signal stays the same. However, if the fiber starts to stretch in some areas due to a vibration or strain, the signal changes. The DIS technology repurposes telecommunication optic fibers as a multi-channel seismic arrays, detecting vibration along the optical fiber. The fiber functions as if there were thousands of sensors installed. The interrogator functions by sending short pulses of laser light into the fiber optic cables and then derives strain or strain rate signals from the strain induced optical disruption, uh, distortion, excuse me, in a back, uh, uh, relay box scattered light in the glass core of the fiber. Time of distance convention allows strain signal to be recorded at spatially localized regions, uh, regions of the fiber, hence transforming the cable into a dense, uh, densely centered sen sensor array. This is known as uh, optical time domain reflectometry. So the box scatter event is to be accurately mapped to a fiber distance. For application requiring high fidelity DIS measurements performance, for example, the OptoSense ODH4 DIS interrogator unit offers one of the ideal solutions. 
but uh, it is not the only one device applied to such a purpose, of course. It's just for an instance. The ODI, uh, ODH4 device is a four laser interrogator, interrogator. With four unique wave, wavelengths, the ODH4 not only provides superior imaging, it provides operators the opportunity to make full advantage of available DIS data by recording multiple, multiple measurements at the same time. The, the dynamic setup capabilities of the device all of the best parameters, purposes for specific apl application, um, such as uh, an earthquake recording. We'll now put, um, uh, look uh, at the another one. We'll now put all what have we sent before to good use in order to provide DIS response, so incident P and S seismic waves. In the process, we will verify two points. The first one, the P wave response of the fibers depend on the square cos uh, cosine of the incidence angle. And the second one, the S wave response depends on the sine of twice on the angle of, of incidence. The incidence angle is the angle between the wire from normal and the fiber. From the figure, you can see that as the incidence angle tends to 90 degrees, this is another one, uh, the fiber response ten, tends to zero. Similarly, the highest responses are seen where the incident wave is traveling parallel to the fiber. This is just uh, according to the law of ge ge geometry. 0 and 180 degrees incidence. There are also wave effects where by lower frequencies are attenuated due to there being less difference in the signals between the end of the gauge. Finally, if you took a cross section through the above plot at constant frequency, we would obtain a function proportion proportional to cos cosine of the incidence angle squared and obtain the first DIS response. And now, okay, I'm going to finish. And now we are going to another diagram. Unlike the P wave, we get now in the S wave response, so incidence angles parallel to the fiber, because in this case, there will be no particle motion in the fiber direction. Similarly, there are now in the DS response when incident is per perpendicular, incidence of uh, 90 degrees. As in this case, there is no relate to motion between the gauge ends. So in conclusion, it has to be said the following. Fiber optic sensors measure the response of the optical fiber to the external forces applied to it. This can be done in a variety of ways, but in general, the principle involves sending a pulse at over an optical laser signal propagating along the fiber and measuring the natural but scattered light. The time of flight, of flight of the laser signal and its backscattered component are recorded and converted, converted into a distance value using the speed of light and the refractive index of the fiber. The idea described in this presentation might be useful not for only the station located at the world ocean coast, but the, uh, for the other stations which have got fiber optic cables as an element of their construction in order to organize additional tools of seismic observation. Thank you very much, my dear colleagues. There is any question? Thank you very much. Do you have uh, a measurement from a real earthquake or real, actually, uh, event? Uh, with this technology? Uh, excuse me. A real measurement. Uh, you, you, you describe uh, the philosophy of measurements and uh, the, the possibility to measure uh, signals from earthquakes beneath the ocean. 
And do you have a real recording from uh, real earthquake? We, we've got no real recording since my station uh, is uh, so far away from any sea or motion. Uh, or, or ocean. Uh, but um, there are a lot of fiber optic cables in uh, the construction my, on, my, on my stations that it's just a theory. It's just a theory you remember, uh, you see. Uh, it's uh, a way how to improve the global uh, uh, seismic observation process. But we are going to uh, consider an idea how to use the existing fiber optic lines in my station to organize additional uh, tools of seismic observation in the future, not now. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much to all of you, to all the presenters. That's the end of this uh, session. There will be now the coffee break, and then we all welcome you to the, to the main room for the closing session and the award uh, ceremony. Thank you very much. Yes, I want just to make one minute.